let's dive in. Um, I guess I should start by saying I will do my best to give a 10 to 15 minute Q&A at the end. Um, I have run through this uh, aiming for a five minute Q&A, so I'll see what we end up with. But um, it's really great to be here. Um, I want to start by telling you a tiny bit about me. I won't go into too much detail, just so you can better understand my background and why I'm so committed to KPIs. So I have an undergraduate degree in psychology and an MBA, and I spent about 10 years building a tech company from idea to profitability and managed to sell that company to a large competitor back in 2018. When I came across Kila and spoke to our founder, Najid, I realized that Kila uh, really married tech with purpose. So it really aims to truly help not-for-profits to do more good in our world. And I can tell you that after two years with Kila, it's really one purpose-driven, passionate company that's dedicated to the not-for-profits not that it helps. Now, in addition to our CRM, we're also leading the space in something called not-for-profit intelligence. And the reason I'm telling you about, a, about this is because that's where the KPIs live. And so what this intelligence function does is it uses the data that's already in your CRM to help you make strategic decisions, just like KPIs do. So we do have a detailed KPI dashboard that's built into Kila, but I'm gonna show you how to build your KPI dashboard uh, in this webinar today using nothing but a simple spreadsheet. Um, I do recommend that as your organization grows, uh, try to find tools, whether it's Keela or other tools, doesn't matter, but find tools that are right for you um, that can automate this process because it's not realistic to try to do this manually as you grow. So with that, let's dive right in. So we're going to start with something fun. I want you to imagine that you're driving a car. Let's make it a shiny red convertible. You're cruising down the highway and there's lots of other cars around you, but you're a pretty good driver. You're quite comfortable behind the wheel. Someone is changing lanes in front of you. Your exit is approaching and you can see far, far up ahead that traffic has slowed down a bit. And I want you to freeze this moment. What information have you subconsciously taken in up to this point? What information has allowed you to feel calm and in control of your situation? Well, first and most simply, you can see through your windshield and you know that you're about two car lengths from the car in front of you. You know from your speedometer that you're going just ever so slightly above the speed limit, which is a pretty reasonable speed for this stretch of road. And you know that your car is functioning and reliable or your check engine light would be on. Now, finally, you can glance in any one of your mirrors to see what's behind you. Now, I want you to imagine for a second that I remove your speedometer. I take away your check engine light and now I cover your windshield. All you have left is your rear view mirror. What do you think would happen next? Well, there's really only two possibilities. One, you would crash. The other, you'd keep going and not crash. Now, you wouldn't know where you were going, but there's a good chance that people might get out of your way and you, know, you might be able to cruise along a little bit longer. Building an organization without KPIs is actually the exact same thing. You're moving forwards, maybe, but success is really only measured by not crashing. And the rear view mirrors? Well, these are like your end of year reports. They simply show you that you didn't crash. They show you after the fact what you didn't crash into, or maybe the exit that you didn't manage to take. So, the point I'm trying to make with this story is that, believe it or not, everyone can get used to driving this way. They go really, really slowly and they crash all the time. But if no one knows any better way, they assume that this is just how you drive. So I spent about 10 years building an organization where we looked at nothing but the end of year report, the rear view mirror. And I would draw my conclusions at the end of the year about what I thought we should do next year. I'd make a plan and then I'd jump back behind the wheel and off I went. No windshield, no speedometer, no KPIs. There's still far too many organizations that drive like this. They use nothing but their gut feelings to guide them day to day and week to week. And then they look at their end of year report to look back at their results for a year that's now over. They don't know how they really did until that end of year report is finalized. Now, I recognize that some things may be measured along the way, 
like perhaps you're measuring donations received to date or something like number of donors in the in your database. And maybe you've stepped it up a notch and perhaps you're even tracking things like average gift size quarterly. And these are really good steps. So if you're tracking two to three KPIs quarterly, you're better than many and you're probably driving like this. You can see right in front of you. You're generally able to avoid crashing, but you can't see far enough ahead to make strategic decisions. Furthermore, you're probably feeling a decent amount of anxiety. I hear from a lot of people that they really feel anxious. They don't know what to do with their limited resources. Running an organization without being able to see clearly is a pretty daunting task. If a few key donors leave, do you know why? Do you know exactly why? If your campaign falls flat and raises, let's say less than half of what you were expecting, do you know what to change next time? And when your year end report shows you recurring donations have dropped, do you know how to fix it? Do you really know, or are you just kind of assuming you have an answer? So what I wanna show you in this webinar is how to drive like this. When you have a full dashboard of KPIs, that's what growing an organization should feel like. You'll still need to drive things forward. You'll need to steer and make quick decisions, but you're gonna be able to see clearly. You'll be able to make decisions based on understanding where you're going and understand what's likely up ahead. So if my driving metaphor has left you with any conclusion, I hope that it's that KPIs are really important. <clears throat> So let's take a step back and, and look at what they are and how you can use them to make your life easier and your organization stronger. So KPI simply stands for key performance indicator. It could also be called a measure, a metric, or it's simply a number that stands for something. It's a measure of some part of your organization that tells you something over time. Now, the part of KPI that I wanna really focus on is this word key. If you measure everything, you're actually only mildly better off than if you measure nothing at all. Too much data can create noise and you won't know what to focus on or why. When you design your KPI dashboard, it's critical that you choose your KPIs based on what you wanna measure and that you understand exactly why that metric's important. So I like to think of it as three main buckets, okay? So you're gonna figure, you're gonna pull some KPIs out of each bucket Bucket and you're going to build your dashboard. So we've got KPIs that your board wants to track. Perhaps this is average gift size, donor lifetime value, or something obscure and unusual. So these are the metrics that the board asks you to report on each quarter. It's really important that you not only understand how to measure them, and how you're, but also how your actions affect them, how what you do day to day will improve or, or cause them to uh, get worse. So the next bucket is KPIs that are used as benchmarks in your industry. Now these ones are the big KPIs. You're gonna see them a lot. They're gonna be familiar to you because they define the most important elements of running a successful not-for-profit. So some examples here are things like donor retention rate and donation growth rate, and perhaps open rate if you're using email as your main source of communication. Now, finally, we have management KPIs. And these are the ones that are often neglected and the ones that we're gonna focus on for the purpose of today's webinar. So these are KPIs that you, you determine are important for you and your team and your organization to understand what the impact your initiatives day-to-day, -day, week to week are having. So these are usually leading indicators while your board and benchmark KPIs are often lagging indicators. And if that's totally Greek to you, I will touch on that in a little bit. So one kind of thought to leave you with before we get to the next section is it's probably not totally intuitive, but consistency in KPIs matters even more than accuracy. Now, I wanna be clear and I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying because if your metrics are not accurate, you're not gonna trust them and you're definitely not gonna use them. But if you know that they're pretty close to accurate or as accurate as they can be, then it's far more important that you are consistent in the way you measure. I'll tell you why. You'll be looking at trends over time. And the most dangerous thing you can do is shift the way you measure month after month in an attempt to be slightly more accurate. 
because what you're actually gonna do is collect pretty meaningless data. So remember, be as accurate as you can be, but then be insanely consistent in how you measure it. So let's walk through some examples of nonprofit KPIs. Now, there are quite literally millions of KPIs that you could choose to measure. So where do you even begin? How do you choose? Well, I recommend selecting a few common KPIs. You've got some here in this list. And then you can add specific KPIs that really are relevant to your organization and what you're trying to do. And from there, you simply begin measuring. And as soon as you start to understand your metrics and see how they move and the volatility and what affects them, you're gonna to start to see a need for new measures. You're gonna to start to see where the holes are. You're also gonna quickly start to see which metrics don't need to be measured at all because they're not gonna show you what you thought they had measured. It's amazing, once you start using this, you will start to get familiar and it'll be really clear what to do next. So if you've ever been told to just jump in and start, this is really one of those initiatives. KPIs will make more and more sense the more you measure them, watch them, and discuss them. So starting really can be the hardest part with this. I'm gonna walk through five KPIs, starting with this one. And it's not because they're the best KPIs, it's quite simply because each one is a different type of KPI. And I want you to understand the different types. So the first one we have is total funds raised. Now this is simply a count of dollars raised. Easy, most people track this regardless. Next, we have donation growth rate. This is the rate at which your donations grow. It could be month over month. It's probably more likely year over year. Now, like I said, for this webinar, we wanna focus on shorter term metrics to avoid looking uh, backwards at the year behind you. So what could we measure that really shows us valuable month over month growth rates? How about taking a look at your recurring donation growth rate? So, Rather than total donation growth rate, which can be really volatile and up and down and doesn't necessarily tell you much, your recurring gifts build month over month as people join the program. And because of this, there's far less volatility. It's gonna be a slow and steady growth rate. So keep donation growth rate at your year, in your year end report because you'll need to know your total donation growth rate, but consider adding recurring donation growth rate to your weekly or monthly dashboard. And there's a reason I'm going into this much detail on things like this. It's because I really want you to understand how to make decisions about your KPIs, how to choose the correct ones for your organization, and then how to manipulate the KPI. So it measures exactly what you need to see to make the decisions you need to make. Next, we have fundraising ROI, which simply stands for return on investment. So this metric would be best applied to a specific campaign because it looks at how much money that you make, you make after all of the costs are accounted for. And then it converts it into a percentage. So here's an example. If you spend $5,000 on a campaign that ends up raising $40,000, your return on investment would simply be the 40,000 you earned minus the 5,000 you spent divided again by the 5,000 you spent. That's 700% ROI. Now, if you look at fundraising ROI per campaign, you can actually make really good short-term decisions. As a year-end metric, you can combine all your campaigns together and get a single fundraising ROI number. Now, this is great for the board because you'll be able to see how much you raised from all your campaigns, how much more you raised than spent. Really important because it shows your donors or your board how effectively you've spent their money after the fact. However, don't get stuck. Trying to measure total fundraising ROI month over month is not gonna tell you which campaigns have been most successful or which campaigns are actually losing you money. You want your metrics to tell you what to do next, what to do more of, what to do less of, and what to actually stop doing altogether. So fundraising ROI per campaign is a great way to modify a KPI to help you make a better decision. Average gift size. This is a great one. It's actually one of my favorites. Um, it can tell you a lot. So on the surface, this metric is simply the middle in a range of gifts that you receive over a period of time. But when you look at this metric combined with other metrics, it shows you exactly where you're winning 
and where you're losing in your efforts. So I wanna tell you a, a quick story to illustrate this. One not-for-profit that I worked with was tracking average gift size annually. They had never used it to make decisions and they simply gathered the data to put on their end of year report. Then they noticed at the end of one year when they were reviewing their report that average gift size, excuse me, average gift size had dropped significantly. They were really surprised because it had been one of their strongest years to date for total funds raised. So they discussed it, they talked about it, and they thought, you know, like, how could this have happened? And one of them considered, could it be because of their new fundraising director? So they hired someone named Maggie, who was a fundraising director rock star, but she was 28 years old, while the fundraising director they had previously was in her 40s. They took a look at the campaigns and the events that they had run, and th what they realized was that all of the campaigns were hugely successful, but they were attracting a really different demographic of donor. Their donor list size had skyrocketed, um, as had their engagement on social media. They had hundreds more donors, but each one was contributing far less than their historical donor group. So this is really great insight. It's amazing. Imagine how much more effective they could have been if they had known this during the year. If they had known that their average gift size was going down, while their total donations was going up and people were you know, clamoring to their website to learn more about their cause, their average gift size was going down. So they could have been strategic. They could have used methods to boost average gift size or methods to encourage maybe online recurring donation signups, something that this younger demographic of donors is far more willing to do. So the point I'm trying to make with this story is that by looking at a metric at the end of the year, you don't have a chance to use the data, to make the changes and to get clever about how to maximize your results before the year's already behind you. The last KPI I wanna look at in detail is recurring gift percentage. Now, I've mentioned it a few times already and anyone who understands subscription businesses recognizes the value of recurring donations. So they may be relatively small individual amounts, but they really add up. And they're a great way to allow donors to feel committed, to show they want to support longer term, and a monthly gift really works with a donor's budget. Furthermore, it provides your organization with a reliable stream of funds. And once you know you have a certain amount of funds committed because it's part of your recurring gifts program, you can make longer term decisions about investments in your programming. So I'm a big fan of recurring gift programs. So how do we use this KPI? You're likely tracking your total dollars received through recurring gift programs, and you're, you're definitely tracking total dollars received. So how can looking at recurring gifts as a percentage of this total help you make a better decision? So think back to my story that I just told you about the organization that failed to use their average gift size until it was too late. This metric will allow you insight into what's really happening with your donors. If you're attracting large numbers of a new demographic of donor and you see that your recurring gift percentage is increasing month over month and you haven't actually changed anything in your communications, it's safe to assume that this new demographic is more open to the idea of recurring gift programs. So this is when you lean in. You develop a campaign that specifically targets them with messaging around your recurring gift program and it aims to sign up as many new donors as you can. You're using your data to be strategic. And I just found out that um, recurring donors actually have 90% retention rate. So it's the highest rate out of all donors. It's a really, really valuable thing to set up if you don't have one. Now, as I said, there's a reason I chose the KPIs I did in that example of five. And it's because each one is a different type. So let's quickly walk through these kinds of KPIs or types of KPIs because you're gonna be using them and adding your own and creating your own. So the first one is simply a count, right? A count of dollars raised. Then we have donation growth rate, which is a rate. Now a rate of donations changing over time, um, it's simply any rate compares one measure per unit to something else. Next, we have fundraising ROI which is a return on investment. And this always looks at the ratio between net profit and cost, how much you made, how much you spent. Now, you can technically calculate an ROI on anything that you spend money or time on, 
assuming that you can convert your time to dollars, which generally we can these days with salaries or hourly wages. Average gift size. This is an average or a typical figure in a data set. And finally, we've got recurring gift percentage and it's a percentage of something else or a proportion of the whole. Now you can use counts, rates, ROIs, averages, percentages. There's many more examples to measure whatever matters to you and your team. And as you review your dashboard each week or each month, you're gonna to start to see holes, holes in your data where measurements are missing. Now, this isn't a problem. This actually shows that you're starting to use your data properly. You're starting to get it. So once you become familiar with your KPI dashboard, you might realize something like this, for example. You're looking at your total funds raised and it's really important and something you need to know. But you kind of want to understand your total funds raised per staff member so that you can defend your new hires to your board and know exactly when you should make your next hire. Your metrics should always help you make these kind of better decisions. So here's another list of KPIs. These are simply KPIs for marketing and donor outreach. We've got things like email open rate, organic traffic count, and cost per lead. There are quite literally hundreds for each section. These are some common KPIs for measuring events. Um, we've got things like uh, event check-ins, event ROI, registration to check-in ratio. So the point is you have to pick and choose because you can't possibly measure it all or you'll be inundated with noise. Too much data creates noise. So select what matters to you and try to figure out what matters most to your organization's success. You can always add new metrics later. Next, I'm gonna walk you through how to use your KPI dashboard, how to set it up and then how to use it. So when you build your KPI dashboard, it's gonna look something like this. And you guys will all have access to the template and the template uh, will look exactly like this. In fact, it's a copy of this one that I'm gonna be running through for analysis purpose. And um, you might wonder where all the numbers are and we'll get to that, don't worry, they're coming. But there is gonna be a lot you'll need to clarify before you begin to measure. So I don't want you to skip this step because it's really crucial. So let's walk through it together. I'll show you what to include in each column. And remember, you can download a copy of this afterwards if you don't already have it, um, but make sure that you edit it and change it and make it your own. Don't just use this one as it is because it probably won't work for your organization's needs. So looking back at what I showed you before, starting left to right, we're gonna go through the columns. So here we've got KPI name. So this is self-explanatory. It's simply what you're going to call your KPI. And I'm going to go through an example using email open rate. That's our example KPI. Now, next we have the definition or what this KPI measures. So you need to define precisely what this metric is intending to measure. In this case for email open rate, it's measuring the percentage of email recipients who open a given email. Again, pretty simple. Now we measure how it's calculated. And this is so important. Remember, we talked about consistency over accuracy. This is where you ensure consistency because you write it down. You write down exactly how you got the metric, if you pulled it from some sort of tool or if you had any calculations that you had to apply. Next, we have why it matters. In this section, you need to get a little analytical and a little thoughtful. It's where you're gonna note your assumptions. You're gonna mention why this metric was chosen, why it matters to your team and your organization. And you might even discuss how to read this metric. So for example, does an increase imply success or does a decrease like donor churn going down is better. You wanna be concise, but really specific. I'd rather you wrote a paragraph and then hit it in your dashboard so that it's there for others than you know, make sparse notes to try to make it look nice. So here we've got email open rate tells us if our audience is engaged, reading our emails and likely to donate. This is an important leading indicator. Track this for each campaign and each weekly newsletter. Next, we have monthly trends. So you're gonna track some metrics weekly and monthly and others are gonna be quarterly or annually. But I want you to make sure that you note the time frame and you discuss the changes that you expect or any volatility or seasonality that you might see. 
I know for not-for-profits, the end of your giving is a big time when seasonality happens. You might wanna make some notes here about that. So back to our example of email open rate, we write, this should be tracked every email campaign. If open rate increases, note subject lines that worked well. When it decreases, try some new subject lines. Next, we have benchmark. Many metrics will have industry benchmarks. They're published by a reputable think tank or association and they're really valuable because they show you how your team is doing and how your organization is doing when compared to all your peers. Now, it's really important to remember that benchmarks are not the best or the worst. So if you're struggling to reach a benchmark, you need to consider how you're doing things because there's likely some really easy improvement available. So here's the benchmark. Email open rate has a benchmark of 26% for the not-for-profit not for space. And finally, your goal, pretty self-explanatory. What is your team striving to hit? What is your target? If you're just setting this up, I'd recommend either waiting to set your goal until you have about three months of data so you can understand what's realistic, or at least being open to adjusting them once you're familiar with your data. What you don't wanna do is set a sky high goal that really demotivates your team if they miss it month after month. Now you're not gonna read this every single time you use your dashboard. So the value in going through this rather onerous process, and I recognize it's gonna take you a couple hours, but the value is twofold. One, it's the process of thinking these things through that's going to make your dashboard valuable. It's gonna to come to life for you if you truly understand your metrics that you've chosen. And number two, if you take the time to do this, your entire team will be able to follow along with you. If you have new hires, they'll be able to get up to speed and check things. I run dashboards across four different teams and I even check definitions here and there as I go to make sure I understand exactly what the metric is trying to measure. So eventually your dashboard's gonna look like this. We're jumping ahead a bit because there's a few more things I wanna cover. And one of them is the vitally important leading and lagging indicators that I've touched on. So leading and lagging ind indicators as a concept um, is quite eye-opening and it single-handedly changed the way my team uses KPIs. So the framework considers every KPI and whether it's a leading or lagging indicator. And it follows this idea that some metrics tell you where you're going and others tell you where you've been. Some help you look forwards and others by definition are always gonna be looking backwards. So how do you distinguish between the two? Let's start with lagging indicators because these are the most common KPIs. And these are the ones that look backwards, the ones that you record on your end of your report that tell you how you did. These are the final measures of the results that you are working as a team to achieve. So they're important, don't get me wrong. It's a measure of something that after the fact, it'll show you whether you've hit your target or not. <clears throat> now, lagging indicators should measure your major organizational goals. And this is key. So your organization probably has some very um, clear impact goals that they're trying to hit. Lagging indicators would be in line with some of your impact goals. They might also be your fundraising goals, something that allows you to make your impact. You should, however, have fewer lagging indicators than leading indicators. For example, total funds raised would be a common lagging indicator assuming that your organization is fundraising. And I'll talk to that in a second because I want to touch on impact metrics. There's many metrics of impact and they can be developed depending on your programs um, that you choose and your impact areas. The challenge is these are very varied and they really rely on your organization's clear understanding of the outputs, the outcomes and the impact you're trying to achieve. And it really is beyond the scope of this webinar because it is such an involved and important process if you want to get it right. And we're actually planning a webinar on impact measurement and impact management. And if you want to sign up for Keela's newsletter, we will um, post as soon as it's ready for signups. We're working on that right now. So coming back to lagging indicators, they really do look backwards at what you've achieved. So this could be even looking back one month or one quarter, one year. But the point is, they're looking backwards. It's after the fact. There's nothing you can do to change it once those numbers are in. So keep in mind, 
it's what your definition of results is that determines whether a metric is leading or lagging. And I'm gonna expand on that in a minute. But let's quickly look at leading, leading indicators to give you some context. So a leading indicator is a measure of activity. Week to week, month to month, this activity is what predicts your results at year end. So a leading indicator is a number that when you watch it carefully, gives you the time you need to make the changes you want before it's too late. So here's an example. Most metrics that measure donor engagement are actually leading indicators. This is because the more engaged your donors are, the more likely they will be to donate. If raising funds is one of your lagging indicators, think of all the things that your team does week over week to ensure that these funds are raised. Measuring any one of these activities, whether it's donor outreach or emails or having events, measuring any one of these things can be helpful because It'll show you whether what you're doing is likely to work or not, whether you're likely to hit your final goal of um, dollars raised. All of these metrics are gonna be in a section of your dashboard called leading indicators. They're grouped together at the top with your lagging indicators grouped together at the bottom. Leading indicators are important to classify because you wanna be really clear about what they achieve and you wanna be able to see the connection because they're connected to your lagging indicators. And it might not be entirely clear what that connection is in the beginning, but you'll soon see that whenever donor engagement in one area improves, a lagging indicator like donor retention rate may also improve. You wanna start watching for those correlations and they're only gonna to appear to you once you get familiar with your numbers. So I wanna do a pop quiz. Really simple, really quick, but just to see if you've captured the idea of leading and lagging indicators. So I'll throw up some KPIs and you can shout at your computer screen, you can type it in the chat bot, whatever you feel um, least strange about doing. And I want to, did that work? Oh, it did, sorry. Um, start with total funds raised. Now this should be easy, I've given you lots of examples of this one. Is that a leading or a lagging indicator? It is a lagging indicator. So this is one of your main goals if you're a fundraising organization. And I really, really stress that. I know not all not-for-profits fundraise, um, but of course we need to have something consistent to show KPIs. So we've chosen fundraising organizations as our model for this webinar. So it's a lagging indicator in that case. Next step, we have website traffic. Is this leading or is this lagging? So this is gonna be a leading indicator and a really important one because it measures awareness. It's important, it's an important part of your donor journey but it's not your end goal just to drive traffic to your website. Next up, we have email open rate. Leading or lagging, what do you think? This one is also a leading indicator. This measures engagement. It's a predictor of donations because if people are engaged in reading your emails, they're likely to donate, but it's not your end goal. Finally, we have donor lifetime value. This too is a lagging indicator. It's a metric that combines lifespan, average donation amount and frequency. And this is one of the ways to measure funds raised and most importantly, the value of each donor. So, I wanna leave you with one last point. Leading and lagging indicators can be different for different people. And I don't wanna confuse you here, but it's gonna be important if you start to really get into metrics and dashboards. So here's an example. A communications director's goal is to drive awareness as measured by subscribers and contacts. So a leading indicator for your communications director might be social media engagement and website traffic. And her lagging indicator might actually be new contacts added because that's what she's trying to do. That's her goal. But your fundraising director has different goals. And her goal is to take all of those contacts that were delivered by all of the efforts of your communications director and turn them into donations. So the leading indicator for your fundraising director might be email open rates while she stewards her potential donors. And her lagging indicator might be funds raised. Now, before I confuse things too much, the dashboard we're building for this 
uh, for this course and is for your organization. So it's not for specific teams or individuals. So if you choose to build team dashboards down the road, this is gonna be an important distinction to understand. Your lagging indicator is always measuring your end goal after the fact. Finally, a few last little things. Know your baseline. Once you determine how to measure your KPI, see if you can look back and get historical data. Three, six, preferably 12 months, but sometimes that's impossible. If you can get historical data, it really helps you to start to see trends. And if you can't get historical data, that's okay. It's just going to take you a little longer to really see the value of your dashboard. So be committed to about three months, um, three months of this. Consider before you start each KPI, what's the right time frame to measure this over? Which direction is positive? Donor churn, a lower number is better. Can measuring the KPI be automated? And I can't stress this enough. You need to find a tool or software that can help you measure or provide your KPIs, and then you can add them to your dashboard. So a software like Keela, we have a lot of these metrics built in, but for example, if you have a website, Google Analytics is great. It can give you lots of data and it gives you the data you need to start measuring and creating your KPIs. And number four, are you committed to doing this for at least three months? So your trends are not gonna appear immediately. You're gonna need at least three months um, unless you have that reliable historical data available. So plan to stick with it at least that long. It can feel like an eternity, but I assure you it'll be worth it. So next up, we're gonna actually run a dashboard analysis. So I'm gonna take you through a dashboard with data in it, and I'm gonna show you how I might run um, a review meeting with my team. And it just gives you an understanding of how to do analysis and what things to dig into and, and how it really helped showcase um, what decisions to make next. So I'm actually gonna switch over and use my screen over here. And it's a much larger screen. So I apologize if you're looking at this huge um, metrics dashboard on a tiny screen, it can definitely help having a larger second screen. So I will begin as if I'm doing a, a normal analysis and this is the first time I've seen this dashboard and I wanna see what decisions I can pull out of it. So we'll start at the top. These are gonna be our leading indicators to start. So let's look at website traffic. This is the total unique visitors that come to our website. Now you can see here, moving right over, we have a goal of 10,000 visitors to our website each month. You can see in January, February and March, we had around 4,000, 4,300, give or take. And then in April, it jumped up to 6,500. Well, isn't that interesting? 6,000, 6,000 kind of holds steady. And then something happens again in August and it jumps up to 7,900 or just under. So I'd be curious, I'd say, hey, team, what did we do in April and what did we do in August? Because obviously it had great impact on our ability to drive traffic to our website. I might make some notes on what happened and make sure that we understand that next time, if we have an event, which the team tells me we did, we had an event in April and we had an event in August. Well, these events are very effective in driving awareness. So let's make sure for our next event, we make website traffic uh, part of our goal and we see how we can do it even better and more consciously. So the next metric is email open rate. And this is the percentage of email recipients who open a given email. And you can see here, we've got a benchmark, an industry average of 26% email open rate. That's great. We think we can do even better. So we've set our internal goal at 30%. Let's see how we've done. I'm looking through January, February, and March, and this is really discouraging. We're not even close to the industry average benchmark. But then we jump up in April, quite a significant jump to 22, 25, 26, wow, something sure changed. And you know what? It seems to kind of align with our website traffic. This is interesting. Now, moving down to the next metric, we see email click rate. And this is the percentage of recipients who clicked on a link in our email out of those that opened it. So they open it and then they actually interact with the content in the email. So 
we've got a benchmark of 13% and a goal of 13%. Now looking at our historical data, I think having our goal at 13 is, is okay because we are way below, again, nine, 11, 8%. But then again, something happens in April. So I say to the team, what happened in April? Because all of our email marketing metrics seem to really jump. We're doing something differently as far as our digital presence. What is it? And they said, well, that's when we hired Maggie. Maggie, again, she is hitting out of the park and she obviously understands how to do email marketing and how to communicate effectively with our donors. So I would pull Maggie aside and say, this is amazing work. Show me exactly what you've done. I'd take a look at what we were doing before, what Maggie has started doing, and I'd document it so that the team knows that this is our new normal. This is how we need to communicate using email with our donors because it's working. Fantastic work, Maggie. So let's slide down to the next metric, which is donor conversion rate. Now donor conversion rate is the percentage of email recipients who actually click on donate now as a link within an email and make a donation. So we want people to be stewarded through emails, but then also become donors. The benchmark for this is 17% and our internal goal is 20%. As you can see across the board by glancing, January, February, our numbers are dismal. We're not even coming close to our benchmark, never mind our goal. So this is where I'd say, hey, Maggie, you're great at getting people to open emails, but I think you could brush up on some donor conversion practices. There's lots on the internet, there's free courses, there's webinars, take some time and really dig into how we can do better with donor conversion. This allows Maggie to focus her efforts. Everyone has resource constraints, it's normal. But if you're asking Maggie to improve all of her metrics, she doesn't know where to start. Here we say, focus on uh, donor conversion rate, figure out how we can do better, and let's see if our metrics in the following months show an improvement. It's the clear path and it's a clear decision. Next one, average gift size. The average size of a gift or a donation from your donors. There's no real benchmarks for this because it really depends on the type of organization you're running, but we've got an internal goal of 175. It looks like in January, we were up at 150, 152, but then it starts to drop in March, again in May, and really drop in June. This is curious. This is something that would raise a red flag and something I'd wanna watch. There's no need to make a big decision on this because we don't know why it's happening just yet. Let's see if any of the other metrics can give us insight. So looking at donor list size, you can see that the, this is the number of contacts, both donors and potential donors that are in our database. So our internal goal is 10,000 people in our donor list. And we start the year in January with 5,000. It bumps up slowly and then it seems to jump or maybe that was about the same. It's really hard to tell. And I don't know if any of you can skim this and immediately tell me which three months were showed the biggest jump in donor list size, but it would be hard for me to figure it out by glancing at this. So I've created a metric after the fact. I went back and said, okay, let's look at donor list growth rate. That simply shows the change month over month in donor list size and the rate at which it's growing. So now you can see six, five, seven, five, four. Great. This gives me far more insight. I can probably guess that March, oh, wait a minute, is it January, February, March, or is it August that we're the biggest? Again, it's not quite giving me the information I need because of course, as your total numbers grow, your growth rate will look smaller when in fact you're adding more people. It's just the way the numbers work. So I added yet another metric. I added contacts added monthly. And this simply shows me how many individual new contacts I have added to my list. And this is still donor list. This is the same list each month. Now I can quickly look at this, skim through and say, okay, what did we do in March? And what did we do in August? Because it really worked. We added a lot of contacts to our list. I would actually probably get rid of row 13, donor list growth rate altogether, because it doesn't show me what I need to see. And I'd probably keep donor list size as a total 
because that this will help me understand how many people I'm communicating with. So already in the first pass, I'm starting to manipulate the KPIs so they work for me. Now, moving down to recurring donation growth rate, we've talked a lot about this on this webinar, and this is the rate of growth in funds from recurring donation programs only. We've got an internal goal of 7% month over month, and you can see here we started the month off slowly, and again, in April, we see the jump and the consistent growth in our recurring gift programs. And this really feeds off of that story I told you. This is the same result from that story where we started to run campaigns that attracted a younger demographic of donor that really liked the idea of recurring gift programs. They started to sign up en masse and we saw huge growth in our programs. Fantastic. As soon as you see this trend, maybe April, May, by June, I would have launched a campaign that focused specifically on acquiring donors to our recurring donation program because evidently it was working, people were interested. And maybe I could have bumped this eight, nine, eight up to a 10 and 15% in the short term. So it helps you make decisions before your year's over. Let's skip down now into lagging indicators. And we're just about done because I wanna give 10 minutes for questions. So your lagging indicators, again, your result metrics. We've got donor lifetime value. Now I've broken this one out into a segment and I'll tell you why, because donor lifetime value as a total is really valuable. It shows you how much revenue a single donor is likely to generate from the moment they first donate to the time they lapse. But it's really hard to treat all your donors the same. Some are going to be small time donors that give you 20, 30, 50 dollars a time and others might give you 500 or 5,000 every time they donate. You really wouldn't approach them with the same ask or the same stewardship. So segmenting your donor lifetime value and working with each segment of donors to help grow that lifetime value, which average gift size is a part of the formula for is going to help you be more specific in how you use your resources and who you target. So here we're looking at how the donor lifetime value changes for our under 100 segment. You can see it follows in line with the ebbs and flows of our average gift size, which makes perfect sense. Donor retention rate. This is an important one, a really important one. This is the percentage of donors who give to your organization one year and then give again the next year. If I would say pick one that's really critical, it would be this one. It's much less expensive to get a donor to give again than it is to acquire new donors. So I'll show you here the benchmark is at 25% industry-wide. We've set an internal goal of 30%. And as I skim through these numbers from January to September, we are doing amazingly well. Donor retention rate is our strength. We are great at it as an organization. So what this tells me is figure out what we're doing, make sure we're conscious of what we're doing and don't change a thing. Don't focus on this. The fact is we don't have endless resources. Let's focus on what we can actually affect positive change in. And we're already hitting 48% donor retention rate. Let's just keep doing what we're doing and save our resources for other parts of our organization. Now for the last two metrics, we're gonna talk about them together because these are the most common and this is total funds raised monthly and total funds raised cumulatively. And I'm just gonna quickly outline the power of understanding your total funds raised monthly because it helps you forecast. I can look at the last three months, July, August, and September and understand that we're averaging around $70,000 in revenue per month. I know what that's likely to add to my end of year um, revenue for the final quarter it's around 215,000. And I also know that that means if we wanna host a gala that raises a huge influx of donations, maybe we could set a new target. Maybe we could tell everyone on our donor list that our big year end goal for our gala is $246,000. Why, why that exact number? Because we hit a million. And maybe it's the first time we've ever hit a million and maybe it can be part of our gala uh, campaign to reach a million in donations. Now, you need your numbers to be able to make that plan to create the content that people use for the gala invitations. So 
It might seem simple, but understanding that ahead of time lets you create a target and a goal that your entire community of donors can rally around. So it's very effective. So that takes us to the last KPI. And I hope that gives you a really nice understanding of how to use this dashboard effectively. And please change it. The way you do that is you copy and paste this and create your own version. You can't have access to this one, otherwise it would change it for everyone else, but copy, paste it, make it your own, do what you need. Um, I also will have a huge database of around 40 KPIs with lots of information that I can send you after the fact. Um, we're just finishing compiling that, but it's, uh, it's a great resource to help you select KPIs if the ones aren't here aren't quite right for you. So with that, I would like to open it up if anyone does have any questions. Thanks, Tassie. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, this is a question from Wiki about the KPI metrics dashboard. Can this be easily repackaged to track a specific team's KPIs, for example, the fundraising volunteers that I manage? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I actually recommend, if it's not kind of too daunting a task, creating dashboards for each team. And we talked a bit about how setting your lagging indicators to match that team's goals is a really good way to show them how their activities are leading to their goals. And if this is a fundraising team, their goals really are gonna be funds raised. And so it might be less about impact. I mean, impact can be on your organizational dashboard, but their team's goals are really gonna be focused around funds raised and what efforts they make, what activities they do day to day to create that outcome, which is funds raised. So absolutely create a separate dashboard and have them run their little huddle meetings where they talk through it and they analyze it. And um, then they can get hyper-focused and they can start to really understand what works for them. Great. Um, thank you, Dazzy. Um, there's one more question that we've got. What's the most effective way to calculate donor lifetime value? So, I mean, the best... The thing I would recommend is quite honestly, Googling it. There's so many articles on there that talk about the different methods and, and how to do it in a way that works for what data you have. I mean, basically what it is, is it's how much revenue this donor is likely to generate from the moment they first donate. If you scroll over, you can actually see the formula here that I've used. So lifespan, and I guess that's gonna be average lifespan. Obviously you don't know each donor's lifespan until it's the end. Um, average donation amount you can calculate and frequency of donation. So again, I really recommend finding software, finding some tools that can do this stuff for you because there's lots of different tools. Keel is a CRM that has these KPIs built in. So just in using it, it will calculate it and give you those numbers. So it's really handy. Calculating it yourself if you're a small organization can be a great start, um, but it's really hard to scale that way. So whether it's Keeler or another tool, finding a tool that automates this is definitely going to be the best way to grow, if not the best way to start. Great. Thank you. Um, we still have a few more minutes, so um, I'm going to um, get to the questions that we have. Um, who should be responsible for tracking KPIs in a typical nonprofit? if I can really answer that. I think it's it's entirely up to you. There, there might be someone who tracks them and populates the scorecard and then someone who runs through them as the lead for the team. And those might be two separate people. On, on our team, it is. It's someone who is responsible for collecting and managing all the data and ensuring it's consistent. And then we have someone who runs the meetings and um, they have a kind of a deeper understanding of the implications and assumptions, whereas the first team member knows how to do the calculations and how to ensure that it's accurate and, and consistent. So it really is up to you. Um, yeah, it's, it's team leads if you're doing team dashboards, or I would say the head of your organization would be the one who runs through, you know, an organizational dashboard with everyone that you feel can, can benefit from the understanding. I think uh, I mean, ours is not a not-for-profit, but we definitely run it with our entire team so that everyone can understand and see what the numbers mean. And it really helps even junior uh, people on our team understand where we're going as, as, a, as a team and as a group, and it helps with alignment. Great. 
Uh, I'm just going to quickly um, ask you one last question that we have. Um, what metrics would you suggest for measuring the success of a peer-to-peer -peer campaign? Hmm. So the, I'm not going to give you exact metrics because it really depends on so many elements of how you run your peer-to-peer -peer campaign. But the way I would think about it is I would start at the very beginning. Think of any, everything like a funnel. And as you come through that funnel, what activities do you have to do and what conversion rates do you see along the way? So with peer-to-peer, -peer, there's always going to be awareness, whether that's through social media engagement, whether that's through however you're marketing and getting your communication out, then there's going to be conversion rates where people actually become involved, whether that's as a contact, whether that's as a donor, whether that's just clicking on a link. So you want to measure those elements of conversion through the pipeline. And then you want to work through what your results are. So whether that's donations raised through each peer-to-peer -peer campaign, which I would definitely say is important to break up per campaign. Um, and then if you want to look at demographic data, like which elements of that campaign were most successful, maybe it's by country or by, by type of individual. I, I don't know how you'd want to break it up, but understanding how to segment the data that you do have so that you can understand how to do things better in the future. But starting, make it a funnel, look at how things move through from awareness or even knowing about the campaign being the starting point to becoming a donor in that campaign being the end point. Great. Um, thank you so much, Tazi. Um, 